Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Today I want to do something a little bit different and I want to see what you guys think about it. Rather than give you a review of a mod or a comparison of a car in two different sims as I have been doing recently, I want to do something a little bit different. I want to do essentially a podcast, Formula One podcast. It is, of course, the month of February, and we are all anxiously awaiting the car launches that are forthcoming in the next couple of weeks, because it has been, as you all well know, a very long off-season. Today I want to talk about what we might be able to expect from Formula One in 2017, because it is all change on many fronts, including the ownership of the Formula One group. Liberty Media, an American company, have recently taken ownership of the Formula One group, the CBC, they are now the commercial rights holders, and that includes all of the TV rights, which is huge in Formula One. So I guess that's basically going to be my focus today. I want to talk about what the transition to Liberty Media may or may not mean for all of us as dedicated, addicted Formula One fans. Now, Liberty Media is an American company, and I am an American. Very odd for an American to be a huge Formula One fan like I am, but I started watching Formula One in 2005. Monaco was the first Grand Prix I watched uh, from beginning to end, and I was absolutely hooked. It was the looks of the cars, the sounds of the cars, Monaco. It was just the perfect combination to really get me interested in everything Formula One and later on everything automotive. And well, here it is so many years later, 12 years later, and I'm still hooked. So, certainly Formula One has been, and I believe will continue to be, an absolutely exciting, engaging media platform for people all across the world to enjoy, for spectators to attend the races, for people to watch on television, and maybe, depending on how Liberty decides to roll out their action strategy for management, maybe to interact with in some other ways that Bernie Ecclestone was not so receptive to, and I mean, well, the internet, basically. Bernie, essentially, for his marketing strategy, didn't have one. He said, well, Formula One is Formula One, it's the highest form of motor racing in the world, and for that reason, and for that reason alone, it will always be successful. Now, he was correct. He was absolutely correct. Bernie did not actively promote the sport in terms of public engagement. He sign the deals with different countries to build circuits. I'm talking about Malaysia, Bahrain, China, India, uh, Japan with Fuji Speedway with the renovation there, and of course now Azerbaijan with the Baku circuit. So Bernie was interacting with and negotiating with politicians in order to promote venues for the sport. And that was good. It certainly grew the sport. It increased the global exposure level, and I would say, yes, it was a good thing in terms of generating revenue. However, in terms of generating fan engagement, the circuits that we got, by and large, are not good for racing. So we have Abu Dhabi, terrible for racing. We have China, terrible for racing. Fuji was good, but we only went there twice. Baku is atrocious. It was a, a snooze fest. Valencia, when the European Grand Prix was held there for a couple of years, it was absolutely atrocious. And Istanbul, I have to say, was probably the only good circuit, the Tilkadrome circuits that we got out of Bernie's negotiations with some oil-moneyed countries. And, well, that departed the calendar pretty quickly, which is very unfortunate for all of us. Those circuits came at the expense of classic European venues, which really, Europe is the home of Formula One. Obviously, the championship, the first round of the championship was held in 1950 at Silverstone in England. So Formula One is through and through a European sport, first of all. Now, the expense that was paid with forfeiting Grand Prix in France at Manicourt the San Marino Grand Prix at Imola. Circuits like those, which were by and large loved, especially Imola, loved. People absolutely love Imola. It is, first of all, a very historic location for a whole bunch of reasons, and it's just a very good circuit in general. It's a good driver circuit. It's a very challenging one for car setup and in terms of the mechanical and aero functioning of the cars. So for Formula One not to have gone to a place like Imola or a place like Manicourt for so long, that's a problem, and fans 
either those of you who have been watching for as long as I have, and certainly for those of you who have been watching for much longer than me, I've seen what you have to say about losing European tracks, and it's a big deal. I have to agree with you. I would love Formula One to go back to places like Imola and Manicor, because not only are they engaging places to watch a Formula One car operate, they're also legendary venues in terms of the history of the championship. I think it's very important that we have those classic tracks on the calendar. Monza has been up in the air several times over the last decade or so, and for the World Championship not to go to Monza? I don't understand that. Silverstone's up in the air right now, and Liberty Media have said, yes, there will be a British Grand Prix and it will be at Silverstone, but for Silverstone even to dream of the possibility of not hosting a Grand Prix, it was the venue of the first ever Formula One World Championship race, the Formula One World Championship as we know it since 1950, for Silverstone even to have to entertain the possibility of not having a race is just mind-blowing to me. So these are the products of Bernie's management style, and I don't want to be critical of Bernie because I have to say he's probably almost single-handedly responsible for turning Formula One into the worldwide juggernaut it is, but it was to the expense of draws to the fans, dedicated fans, because we Formula One fans, we know the sport inside and out. We know its history. We know the regulations, the sporting and technical regs. We stay up to date with those changes year after year. They change sometimes completely between one season and the next. And we're all over it because we love this sport. We're very entertained by it. We love what we see on and off the track. We love the history. We love the technical details of everything. So we're an engaged fan base. So if trying to engage more people in the sport in its classic mode of operation was Bernie's goal. I'd have to say he failed at that because we have more races now and we have more races in more countries now, but we don't have a real homage being paid to the history of the sport. So for this reason, I think it's good that Bernie is gone. That being said, though, I am very worried about Liberty Media's takeover of Formula One. I'm an American, and Liberty Media is an American media company. That's not a bad thing on the face of it, but as an American, I'm very aware of American sports. I don't watch most of them. Quite honestly, they're, they're boring. They're not entertaining. I do not like American football. I don't watch basketball. I don't watch hockey. I don't watch baseball. They're just boring. I don't like them. Motorsport is my poison of choice. It's basically the only sporting contest, aside from the Olympics and the World Cup, that I'll pay any attention to. So, for Liberty Media to be taking over Formula One, I say good because, well, it's going to be more exposure, hopefully, on U.S. terrestrial television for Formula One. Great. But, because I am aware of how American sports operate, I'm worried that Formula One may start to become gimmicky. And I'm not talking about gimmicks like DRS and, to some extent, curs. I'm talking about gimmicks in terms of how points are allotted and how championships are awarded. Those of you who watch NASCAR over the last several years, you'll be intimately familiar with the absolute ludicrous that is the chase for the cup. The chase is the final 10 rounds of the championship, and basically the first 20, 25 races, however many races there are that year, only count for drivers getting into the chase, and then the points essentially go back to zero for the last 10 rounds of the championship, and then that is how your champion is crowned. Now, NASCAR and Formula One are two very fundamentally different racing disciplines. NASCAR it is much lower budget than Formula One, first of all. It's a homologated one-make series. Yes, you have Fords and you have Chevys and you have Toyotas in there, but the cars are all essentially identical. The engines are essentially identical and all of that. Yes, they have different builders, different suppliers, whatever, but the specs are so close to one another that it is a one-make series. So everybody has essentially the same equipment, so it really just comes down to luck of the draw. Any driver on the grid for a NASCAR race has a reasonable shot and an equally reasonable shot of winning that race, just depending on how well he plays his strategy and how lucky he gets with avoiding incidents on track. 
Formula One is different. The teams, as we know, are constructors. They design, they manufacture, and they operate and race cars of their own making, their own design. So it's not a one-make formula, and there's a pecking order in Formula One. You have teams that have been around for a long time. They understand how the game is played. They have good designers, good aerodynamicists. They attract top driving talent. And they tend to win things, as we've been seeing for the last few years with the domination of Mercedes. They're the best team on the grid. They've attracted the best drivers on the grid. Lewis Hamilton, a three-time world champion. Nico Rosberg, certainly. He was no slouch. He won his first and looks to be only world championship last year, but they've attracted good drivers. Similarly, Ferrari have attracted good drivers over the years. We all know about Michael Schumacher, but Rubens Barrichello was no slouch. Kimi Raikkonen, he's a world champion, driving for Ferrari. Sebastian Vettel, the four times world champion, well, he's driving for Ferrari as well. So the teams have a pecking order, they know what they're doing, and the more established they are, the more likely they are to have continued success, and the more likely they are to attract the top talent. Fine. What I'm worried about, though, is with Liberty coming in, are they going to try to emulate a NASCAR model? So, in other words, are we going to start to see a chase for the championship in Formula One? I certainly hope not. I know Formula One has had some weird point systems over the years, particularly in the 80s when the top 10 or top 11 results only counted toward the championship, which, again, was ludicrous and kind of similar to what NASCAR does with the chase. But I'm hoping, because Formula One has not had a system like that for a very long time, I'm hoping that the point system, the way the points are awarded, and, of course, the way the champion is decided is unchanged because it's just... It means that the first round of the season is just as important as the last round. Unless you have a complete domination, as we saw from Ferrari in 2002, where Schumacher had the championship cinched up by round 11 of 17. Uh, we have not seen a situation like that in a very long time, and I think that's good for the sport as well. It shows just how close the competition is, either between teams or between drivers on the same team, as we've seen from 2014 to 2016 with Hamilton and Rosberg at Mercedes. Great. What I hope that we don't see from Liberty Media is something like points for fastest lap, points for pole position, reverse grids, any sort of ludicrous idea like that, because, again, I'm a big proponent of the sports history and the, and the sports heritage, so I want that to be respected and perpetuated. Evolution is good, though. So, if Liberty do have some ideas about can we make the system a little bit more equitable? So teams like Manor, for example, don't have to fold if they don't score points in one year. Or, say, they have a car that's built. Manor have two cars, at least two chassis that are completed. What happens to those cars? Can somebody pick them up? Can there be a new team that just buys out the Manor cars and then is able to join the grid without having to wait a year or five years or whatever it is that the CBC used to dictate and without having to pay a huge entry fee for the championship? Maybe. Things like that to make the grid a little bit more equitable in terms of the financial situation might be beneficial as well as to bring new upstart teams into the sport because whenever we have less cars on the grid it's not good. So certainly some ideas that Liberty may have, again, I don't know what the specifics are for that are, but hopefully we start to get some initiatives from Liberty that are constructive in that manner, but do not impact the overall feel and provenance and heritage of the championship. With that said, we've got some more news to take care of. Again, we'll have to wait and see in terms of what happens with Liberty, but we have some more news here with McLaren. McLaren have been in big, big trouble recently, and I don't think we have to talk about why and how that came to be. Honda came on board with them in 2015, the engine was terrible, the car was terrible, <laughs> and the Honda have not improved so much. I mean, yes, they have improved, but they're not fighting for... they're not even fighting for points on a regular basis, let alone podiums or wins, so McLaren are in big trouble. Fine. Big restructuring at McLaren over the end of last season and, of course, through the winter. Ron Dennis, who was at the helm of McLaren since 1981, when his Formula 2 team, Project 4 Racing, merged with the McLaren group. And then Ron Dennis became the grand everything, team principal, CEO, chairman, executive director, all of the titles, Ron Dennis. 30 years or so, Ron Dennis was in that position. 
Ron Dennis is now gone. The merger with what whatever was left formerly on paper of Project 4 Racing is gone. McLaren once again are simply McLaren. McLaren announced today that their new car for 2017 is going to be called MCL32. Now, a lot of people are up in arms about this, and I tend to echo and sympathize with that sentiment. First of all, McLaren have been calling their cars MP4 for a long time, since 1981 when the MP4-1 was introduced. Of course, the MP4-1 being the first car to race that was chiefly constructed of carbon composites. So, there's first of all, there's a long precedence of McLaren calling their cars MP4, but also there's some historical significance there too. McLaren, especially through the 90s and early part of the 2000s when they were still really competitive and fighting for championships, they had a reputation for being innovators, for being industry leaders in terms of automotive design. And of course the McLaren F1 road car from the early 90s, still considered by many people, including myself, to be the best road car ever produced. That McLaren MP4 designation, it has a lot of emotional weight to it. So for McLaren, I understand that Ron Dennis is completely out of the picture, but for McLaren to be calling their car something different now, MCL32, it's a little bit of a shock to the system. And given the position that McLaren is in, politically speaking here, I'm not sure it's the best move. McLaren have had a really hard time since 2007, really, with the whole Spygate problem. They have not been in the position to challenge for the Constructors Championship since 2007, which they would have won had they not been disqualified that year. But since 1998, McLaren have not been win within a shout of winning the Constructors Championship. 1998 was the last time that they did win it. So we're approaching 20 years since McLaren were able to fight for the Constructors Championship. For a name as big as McLaren, that is a huge problem. What this is going to mean is 2017 could very well be a make or break year for McLaren. I remember a few years ago in one of my videos, I in passing brought up the point, I think this, this video was made in like 2015, but I brought up the point in passing that McLaren could fold in the not too distant future and uh, I thought it was an absolutely fantastical idea, but I'm not sure how crazy I am anymore because Ron Dennis is gone. I don't understand the real reasons for the restructure. I don't know why Ron Dennis has been dropped. It could have something to do with McLaren's recent form, but in terms of Ron Dennis being exclusively at fault for that, I don't think he is to any degree. Honda and McLaren's overall design philosophy are truly to blame. And in terms of the problems with McLaren design, well, that goes all the way back to 2009 when they had that absolutely atrocious start to the season. After having Lewis Hamilton win the World Championship in 2008, they were just nowhere in the beginning of 2009. But Ron Dennis, with that leadership and with that technical prowess that McLaren are so well known for, they came back to win races toward the end of 2009. So. McLaren used to have the ability even to start with a bad car and then recover something by the end of the season. We have not seen that since 2009. 2010, sure, Button and Hamilton, they were fighting for wins, they did get some wins. 2011, same deal. 2012, not so much. Yes, Hamilton is one of the few Formula One drivers who has the distinction of winning at least one race in every year that he has competed, but McLaren, they were not in the pound seat at all by any means since 2007 2008 and then of course Hamilton seeing that trend not likely to change anytime soon decided to move to Mercedes and well the rest is history two more world championships to his credit with Mercedes McLaren now with the change of the car name with dropping Ron Dennis dropping the whole project Four association but continuing with Honda, I don't understand truly what they're doing. Because it doesn't seem to me that they are changing their trajectory. They're changing the way things look, but they're not changing the way that they're running the team. And I mean, it, it remains to be seen how their car performs when winter testing gets started up in a couple of weeks, but 
I have no real hopes that McLaren are going to do anything good this year, to be honest, because a lot of things have changed with the regulations for 2017, but one of the things that have not really changed is the engine specification and the engine regulations. We've got the same V6 1.6 liter turbocharged hybrid power units that we've had since 2014. Honda are still supplying McLaren's power unit, so I do not believe that we're going to be, see to be seeing any real change in where McLaren stacks up relative to the rest of the grid. Sure, we could get a surprise. McLaren could just find a secret in terms of aero philosophy that nobody else thinks about, and they could just run away with the championship at the beginning of the year, much like Braun did in 2009, the last time we had a real radical shakeup to the aerodynamic design, but with maintaining the engine specification. It is altogether possible that McLaren or another team could follow suit and do something similar, but again, I, I don't really think so. The best teams on the grid right now, Mercedes and Red Bull, they've been working on their 2017 cars for quite a while, simply because they have the resources to do so. Remains to be seen what teams like Ferrari and Williams might do, because again, long-standing teams in the sport. Ferrari have been there since the beginning, Williams have been there since the early 70s, so they know what they're doing as well and Williams of course they have a pedigree of winning championships as well Williams have not been in a position to challenge for the championship since the mid 90s but the potential is there and especially because they've not had the best seasons in 2015 and 2016 the, the chances are they decided to invest a great deal of time and energy into their 2017 car from the instant those regulations were finalized midway in 2015 so it's possible that a team like Williams or Ferrari may have had a jump start on 2017, and they've also come up with something that's going to shake up the pecking order. So I'm not going to discount anything here, but I still think we're going to have a huge disparity in power units, and, well, Honda is bringing up the rear with that. McLaren, the only team running the Honda engines, there's going to be a problem there. The last point I have about McLaren is simply... Why did they call the car MCL? I, I don't understand. Obviously, MCL being the first three letters in the name McLaren, but doing a little bit of research back to 1980, the last McLaren to be produced before the merger with Ron Dennis's Project 4 Racing was the M30. Yes, I understand that the last McLaren to be produced was the MP431, but... I would have called the car M31 to continue that original McLaren series that existed prior to Project 4. If you want to get rid of Ron Dennis and you want to get rid of all associations with Project 4 Racing, call the car M31. McLaren 31. Just my preference. But I don't know. They'll do what they'll do. And to, to say that I'm not a McLaren fan lately is an understatement. They have... A wonderful history in the sport they have been huge innovators in terms of automotive design but the team just have entirely lost their way in the last seven eight years and I don't see it changing anytime soon they've also expanded their industrial interests to producing a much more expansive road car lineup than they ever had previously in the early 90s, they introduced the McLaren F1, which was their their first real road car designed to be a road car. But that was it. They made one car in very limited numbers, and they, they went GT racing with it as well with some great success. And then that was it. Now they're producing five or six different road cars, and they're making far larger numbers of them than they ever did with the F1 back in the day. So McLaren, just as an industry in its own right, has started to diversify its interests and therefore diversify its its expenditure of resources and I think the Formula One team certainly has suffered with that. I think there's a parallel also to be, dr to be drawn there with Ferrari because Ferrari haven't been in a position to challenge for a championship since 2010 really. They uh, obviously won the championships in uh, 2007 and 2008 but they haven't been in a position to to do that since 2010 they were really close and Fernando Alonso probably should have won that 2010 world championship and Ferrari probably should have won that constructors championship as well but again Red Bull they just were in the right place at the right time and 
for whatever reason, Ferrari at that point decided to move away from investing 100% of their focus into the Formula One team, and they decided to expand their road car lineup. They developed LaFerrari, which is an absolutely incredible road car. It's probably the best road car out there today that you can theoretically buy, but I think it is to the expense of the Formula One team, just like McLaren. Ferrari, of course, they are producing a lot more road cars than they used to, and this has to do as well with the recent industrial politics of the merger between Fiat and Chrysler, so there, there's a whole lot more money to go around in terms of the climate around Ferrari, but I'm not, I'm not so sure the demand has increased. I mean, I, I assume it has to some extent if they're producing more cars, supply and demand, Economics 101, but Ferrari are a racing team, and they're so famous because of their racing success. They've always made good road cars, but Enzo Ferrari, he started to produce road cars so that he could finance the race team. So, again, just like McLaren and Ferrari, I think have also lost their way. But that's beside the point. In terms of overall, what Formula One is going to look like in 2017. Huge aero overhaul. The cars are going to look very similar to how they looked toward the the end of the mid 2000s so from about 2004 to 2008 that last generation of the super crazy topside aero that we saw back then and the cars absolutely looked ridiculous in a very good way they just looked like something that Batman would drive in the year 2200 or whatever they were gorgeous cars they sounded great because they had the V10 engines but they were fast they were really fast 2002 to 2004 in particular, they were really fast. 2005, they would have been really fast as well, and they still were, but the single set of tires for the entire race distance and qualifying, that really just put the nail in the coffin for resetting a lot of lap records in 2005. But I have to say, the way the cars are going to look next year, or this year rather, they're, it's going to be good, and it's going to be a return to what Formula One should always have been. Also, you're going to see the return in terms of aero philosophy of topside aero rather than trying to exploit diffusers. You're going to have bigger diffusers on the cars this year, which is obviously going to help downforce, but you're going to have larger wings, lower wings, so the return of the topside aero philosophy, it's going to be there, and I think it's going to be good in terms of cornering grip. A lot of corners on individual racetracks people are talking about turn three at Barcelona for example they're gonna be flat out so could you imagine you break into turn one at Barcelona and then you don't come off the gas again until turn four that long not quite 180 degrees but that long right-hander turn three at Barcelona that's gonna be entirely flat I'm not even sure if that was the case in 2004 when we had the highest grip levels that we've seen in recent decades. But it's going to be something else. And of course we've got wider tires, so we're going to have more mechanical grip. That's going to mean that our braking distances are going to be shorter. The drivers are going to be able to brake later. Uh, perhaps they're even going to be faster in the rain too. Wider tires are going to help you in any sort of circumstance, wet or dry. The rear wings are going to be wider and they're going to be lower. So again, very similar to what we had toward uh, the end of the early 2000s, I guess we can call it, 2008. Certainly the cars are going to be much more aesthetically pleasing, and even the most conservative estimates that I've heard is uh, that the cars are going to be at least three seconds a lap faster, probably more so in the five to six seconds per lap range. And with these engines that we've got, sure, they don't sound very good, but they have so much torque and so much mid-range power that they could be the fastest cars ever, truly. Because the Mercedes power unit, particularly the spec we saw toward the end of last year, certainly that thing was producing over 1,000 horsepower in qualifying. So when you start to couple that with a car that has a lot of grip, rather than the, the drivers having to balance the throttle through the corners like we've been seeing, with the car skating all over the place in perfectly dry conditions, I think these things are gonna be absolutely sucked onto the racetrack so just like we saw in 2004 into Cops Corner at Silverstone, for example, where the drivers just approach flat out, they pop a downshift at full throttle and then throw it at the apex, I think you're going to start to see that again. So 
I hope I'm right, and I hope that it turns out to be a good show for all of us, because I'm tired of seeing Formula One cars that look like they're in the rain, in the dry, basically. And I'm tired of seeing drivers have to take care of the tires so much, and I'm tired of having to see drivers under drive for all sorts of reasons. I want to see these guys going flat out all the time. Is that good for overtaking? Maybe, maybe not. I think it throws back in the variables of not only driver skill, but driver fitness. The cars of recent years, they've had less downforce, they've generated uh, less cornering force, so the drivers have not been under as much stress. So drivers who maybe aren't as fit as some others, they could get away with it. Now I don't think that's going to be as possible. If the cars are really going to be four to five seconds a lap faster, you're going to be generating most of that time in the corner, so if you're going faster through a corner, you're going to generate more G-force. So if you are in better shape than the next guy, that's an advantage. People are saying that the shorter braking distances are going to make it more difficult to overtake. I really don't think so. Honestly, I think it's just going to be a question of who breaks latest, as it always has been. And of course, we've got drivers like Hamilton and Ricardo who were very good at braking late. So I still think racers will be racers. So it doesn't matter if they have to break over a kilometer or 100 meters. The guy who breaks latest is probably going to have an advantage going into a corner. So I don't think the breaking distances are going to matter so much. The only variable that's really an unknown, and the, this was something that the initial changes back in 2009 were supposed to address, but they never really did, was how closely can the cars follow nose to tail. 2009, we had the, uh, the low, flat, really ugly front wings, and then these high, narrow rear wings that we still have today. It's just... It, first of all, it, it's an ugly design, but secondly, it wasn't effective. You took downforce away from the cars on the rear end where you need it most. If anything, if you wanted to improve overtaking, take away some front downforce which is going to put understeer in the car in the corners and slow them down like you wanted to, but overall, if you take away front downforce, you're going to increase straight line speed. And you wouldn't have to do it with DRS, like we ended up with. So, I don't understand the aero philosophy of 2009 at all. Sure, if you have a, a downforce bias toward the rear, the car is going to be a little bit unstable in the braking zones, perhaps, but, again, you need more finesse to deal with it, and I think we would have gotten much more of a show from the drivers without the artificiality of something like DRS. But let's let bygones be bygones and look toward what we have now. I don't think the cars are going to be able to follow closely nose to tail with this new aero specification because it's still the same. It's the same overall philosophy that we've had since 1995 topside arrow with wings and barge boards and other flow modifiers on the top side of the car. So if you have turbulent air coming off of a car that's running in front of you, everything on your car is not going to operate as efficiently or as effectively as it would in clean air. So I don't think we're going to see any change at all in terms of how cars are able to follow nose to tail. I could be completely wrong, and that remains to be seen. We'll see if we get any nose to tail running in the packs uh, like we really should be seeing in testing, but uh, who knows? Who knows? Honestly, I think that there should have been research and development work done very early on in all of this, even before 2009. Get cars on the track, have them run in traffic. How do they react and what sorts of modifications can we make to make sure that they are going to react as we want them in turbulent air? But that, that was never done because that would have been too logical, at least in the Bernie era. We'll see about Liberty, but I don't think we're going to see any sort of change. The reason for this is, again, it's topside arrow. If you want the cars to operate effectively in turbulence, you need to exploit other areas to generate downforce. And if you want to do that, I think you need to start to explore ground effect again. Because, well, ground effect, all it depends on is accelerating the air that is underneath the car. As air speeds up, it decreases in pressure. So. If you want to create a Venturi tunnel under the car like we had in the late 70s and early 80s, great. IndyCar, they exploit this effect, and they're able to follow nose to tail around ovals at 220 miles an hour plus. So IndyCar knows how to build a car that can follow itself nose to tail and not lose much speed and not lose much downforce. 
So I'm not saying that Formula One should become IndyCar, and I'm certainly not saying that Formula One needs to run on ovals, but if you want a car that can follow itself nose to tail, ground effect is the way to go. Indy cars have flat bottoms for a reason, and Formula One cars don't have flat bottoms for another equally good reason, really because of Imola 94, but with the increases in safety both in car design and in terms of circuit design, why can't we have flat bottoms anymore? Why can't we have skirts? Why can't we seal the diffusers with the track surface and, and truly create that that Bernoulli principle and that Venturi effect underneath so that we can get stable, consistent downforce at speed. I don't understand it. Because even with crosswinds, there's an effect on downforce. As long as you have clean air running over the car, the topside air is fine. But create ground effect. I don't understand why nobody's researching this. It works. It worked back in the 70s and 80s. It would still work today. And maybe it would require some fundamental changes in car design. Maybe they'd have to become more wedge-shaped like they were in the 80s. So be it. We just invested all of this money into creating this new aero specification for 2017. And we don't know what the results of are what the results are of it yet, but honestly, I don't think it's going to work. I could be completely wrong, but we're still barking up the same tree that we have been for quite a long time. And the definition of insanity is doing the same action over and over and expecting a different result. And I don't think we're going to have a different result. I would love to see more aero innovation. I'd love to see more aero, more uh, engine innovation, rather. I'd love to see more innovation, period, in Formula 1. It's, it's probably the real reason that I love the sport so much, because it is not a one-make formula like IndyCar, like GP2, like NASCAR. Because the engineers and designers are allowed to play, and they're allowed to interpret the regulations within reason any way they want. So, for Formula One to be restrictive, as it has been especially in the last 15 years probably, it's not good for the sport. It has grown, mostly because, to go back to one of our points from the beginning, because Bernie, he promoted the sport in new marketplaces, but really it was not because of any sort of revolutionary things in the design of the cars. I want these cars to be fighter jets, basically. I want them to be prototypes in the traditional sense. We're going to try something new, something that nobody has really done before, and we want to see if it works, because the only way that you make discoveries is to step outside of your comfort zone and to try something that maybe sounds a little bit crazy, and you never know, it just might work. I want to see that climate in Formula One again. I want to see a Formula One where we could get a Brabham BT46, the fan car. I want to see a climate where something like that is a viable option. Maybe not necessarily a fan car, but something that is just out of the box. It breaks the mold, and it gets people talking about race car design again. I want that. I want something that's going to to break cover and people are not going to know what to say about it. When we see these 2017 cars, they're going to look good. They're going to look a lot better than the cars have looked since 2009, granted. But I'm not so sure we're going to see anything that's going to make all of the pundits say, hmm, what is that? Within a couple of days of every car's launch, we're going to have detailed write-ups on a whole bunch of websites from a whole bunch of very good journalists and commentators about the little design features that we've already divined from just looking at launch spec pictures and we're gonna basically know what the pecking order is before the cars even hit out on track. But what if, and this is a big if, if Liberty are able to channel the American innovative spirit, at least that the United States used to have, and say, you know what, we're gonna open it up a little bit more. Try something new. Go to the moon. You know? I would love for that to happen, and I think a lot of people in Formula 1, particularly the designers, particularly Adrian Newey, would love to get that kind of a directive. Go play and see what you come up with. It just maybe might work. But that's basically 
what I have to say in terms of the state of Formula 1. I'm sure a lot of this rambled on a lot longer than it needed to, <laughs> and uh, if you are still listening, apologies. But that's what I think about 2017. That's what I think about the nonsense that McLaren have been doing. And honestly, I don't know what to expect in terms of the pecking order. I don't think it's going to change much. We could get a surprise from a team like Ferrari or Williams, but I still think it's going to be Mercedes at the top, followed by Red Bull, followed by probably, probably Ferrari, but a distant third, just like they have been since 2014. Maybe Williams could come back. It's possible. They've got Lance Stroll, Felipe Massa. They uh, brought him out of his very, very brief retirement, it has to be said. Massa may well like these cars because he, he came into Formula 1 in 2002, the beginning of the absolutely ludicrous speed era. So Massa may yet have something really important to offer in terms of results for Williams. I don't think he's past his prime by any means just because he's one of the older drivers on the grid doesn't mean anything. He has plenty of experience, and he has experience in this type of car, which I think is very important, particularly because Bodas has gone to Mercedes. So Williams would have been left just with Lance Stroll and who knows who. So he's going to be good at Williams, Felipe Massa. Alonso, maybe he's somebody to watch. Again, he won his championships in this type of car, so he certainly knows what he's doing with high downforce, high cornering grip. Again, it all depends on what McLaren do with the MCL32. Remains to be seen. Honda power unit, probably not going to be there for them. Mercedes, dominant. Lewis Hamilton, he's probably going to win the championship this year, let's be honest. Bottas, he's definitely going to take his first win this year. I wonder where it will be. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's actually something of interest to me. When a driver who hasn't won a race before comes into a top team and you, you know he's going to win his first race, it's always just a, a subject of interest to me. A little bit on the periphery. When will it be? Kovalainen was really the last time I can remember a, a driver, relatively new driver, coming into a top team when he went to McLaren for 2008 and then he won the race in Hungary. So just interested to see when and where Botas will take his first victory. And who knows, it may even be in Australia and then he's a championship contender from day one. I don't think they're gonna ask him to play second fiddle to Lewis. They might, but who knows? But again, I think it's going to be Hamilton winning this year and of course Mercedes being dominant as ever. Botas is very capable. He certainly will be capable of following Lewis home on most days, if not winning in the place of Lewis if Lewis has a problem or just gets it wrong on strategy or gets it wrong in qualifying, whatever. So look for Mercedes still to be fast. Look for Red Bull to be following them and probably challenging for wins. Ricardo and Verstappen, of course, Verstappen took his first win last year in Spain. I expect him to do more of the same this year. He's been an absolute phenomenon to watch. He's probably the most exciting driver I've ever seen come into Formula 1. And I, I was a Hamilton fan from the beginning. His first race in 2007 in Australia, absolutely phenomenal to finish on the podium in your first race. A few other drivers have replicated that feat since, but Verstappen, he is just an all-out fighter, and I don't think he really cares what people think about him. So. Certainly, I'm very excited to continue watching Verstappen at Red Bull, and of course, Ricardo. He deserves more. He truly deserves more. He is another feisty guy. First of all, he seems like a really good guy, but he's a feisty racer. He knows how to wring the neck of a race car, and who knows? We'll see what happens. But hopefully, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It's a big change of pace for me, and... Let me know what you think, what I could do better, what I could do worse, and uh, whether or not you want to hear more podcast-type things like this in the future. So thank you very much for watching slash listening. Ferrari Man 601 saying we will see you later.